great, thank you. First of all, yeah, sorry not to be joining you in person. I'm, I'm in the UK this week, uh, generally in DC. Uh, but let me also say thank you for very much for having me. Uh, and thank you all uh, for your voices and the work that you're doing. Uh, I think you have a very important voice in this, both for the insights and knowledge and understanding you bring, uh, having you know participated, many of you, in these on-the-ground tours, having met with a number of folks uh, on these issues already, uh, as well as for the voices you bring as voices of conscience from within the Christian community. Uh, you know, as we know, the community is divided. Uh, and I think it is important, particularly for legislators, uh, to hear, uh, because they hear a lot from some organized uh, voices like KUFI, Christians United for Israel. Uh, it is really important to show uh, that there is another side to this, and they should not assume that those voices speak for the entire Christian community. Uh, so I just wanted to start off by thanking you. Uh, so, I mean, what I thought I would talk to you about is, is the thing that I'm for most, most familiar with, right? Uh, which is U.S. security assistance and arms transfers, and particularly in advance of meetings, I understand uh, many of you are having on the Hill, uh, where sort of the opportunities and pressure points are in that space. Uh, just before I get into it, some, some further context. Uh, so until I resigned last October, I worked in the State Department's uh, Bureau of Political Military Affairs. Uh, so that is the part of the U.S. government that is responsible for American uh, what we call defense diplomacy, essentially the, the nexus between uh, foreign policy and military affairs. And, you know, most people, when they think about things like security assistance and arms transfers, they tend to think of Defense Department, right? Uh, not many people realize that this is part of the State Department, uh, or at least didn't until this year. Um, but, you know, it's in State Department for a reason. It's there because the U.S. government has, you know, essentially since, you know, after World War II, since the Marshall Plan, uh, seen all forms of foreign assistance, including military assistance, as a tool of foreign policy. Uh, it is there, you know, not only to build the capacity of foreign security forces and, and all that sort of thing, but because it is a tool of our foreign policy, it is a tool of our diplomacy, uh, it is a tool that theoretically uh, gives us influence and leverage over partners around the world. Uh, that's why it's at State Department, and, and that's why it's particularly irksome uh, to hear, you know, State Department from the podium, as they have many times in the last year, uh, say, well, we don't tell our partners what to do. Uh, no, actually, the reason the State Department does this stuff at all is in order to be able to tell our partners, uh, or at least press them uh, and and make ourselves or remove ourselves from complicity uh, in what they do if they don't if they don't follow through. Um, so so just for mm -hmm. further background, uh, you know, prior to working in state, I'd been, you know, uh, in several jobs, both in the U.S. government and adjacent to the U.S. government, uh, in the national security sector, including in the Pentagon, on the Hill, uh, and also spent 14 months uh, living and working in Ramallah uh, for an organization called the U.S. Security Coordinator that I'll, I'll talk about briefly in a second. So I think it's useful to just recognize uh, what the U.S. provides in the Israel context. Uh, and the bottom line is it's almost everything. Um, starting with fighter jets. And so, you know, one of the repeated questions has been, well, you know, is there, what are the links to the U.S., uh, between the U.S. Uh, and, you know, what has been done uh, certainly in Gaza for the last almost a year, uh, now in Lebanon. Uh, and of course, we've also seen a strike uh, against, you know, civilian targets, frankly, in Yemen. Um, and many have said, well, it's very hard to link bombs to, you know, specific bombs to specific targets and all this kind of thing. Uh, but the bottom line is that the aircraft dropping those bombs, uh, all of the fixed wing fighter jet aircraft that Israel flies are of U.S. origin. Uh, and there is, therefore, a direct linkage between any airstrike that Israel conducts uh, and U.S. technology, U.S. weaponry. Um, you know, there is a uh, something called National Security Memorandum 20, some of you may have heard of, uh, which was a report required by the White House, required, you know, that it set for itself uh, as a result of negotiations it conducted with Congress uh, that required the State Department to report on the involvement of U.S. weapons uh, in uh, potential violations of international humanitarian law in Gaza. Uh, that report was delivered to Congress in May. And there, indeed, the State Department itself acknowledged uh, that, you know, because all of the planes dropping these weapons are of U.S. origin, there is inherently a U.S. link. So this is not just me saying that, well, you can extrapolate 
Uh, this is actually something that the U.S. government itself has acknowledged. Uh, of course, the U.S. also provides the air to ground munitions themselves, many of them. Israel produces some of them. Um, it provides ground munitions, whether we're talking about tank shells, uh, whether we're talking about mortar munitions or this sort of thing, uh, firearms, uh, critical technology for tanks. So Israel makes its own tank, the Merkava, uh, but the engine is American. The design for the tracks is American. Uh, the scopes are American, et cetera, et cetera, uh, as well as critical uh, intelligence and collection technologies. Um, so in short, uh, a broad sort of and deep, you know, U.S. nexus to all of what we are seeing. Uh, and I would encourage you, the uh, American Friends Service Committee, AFSC, uh, has a good web page that also lists all of the U.S. manufacturers uh, who are part of this uh, supply chain to the Israeli Defense Forces. Uh, just to give us a sense of what we've transferred uh, or authorized since last October, uh, this table is actually from an organization called JINSA, Jewish Institute for National Security Affairs, which is a strongly uh, pro, I wouldn't even say pro-Israel, but pro the most right-wing elements of Israel uh, organization in D.C., very closely aligned with APAC. Uh, and this is their own table uh, that shows, as you can see, everything from, uh, you know, air-to-ground munitions, as we've just been discussing, uh, you know, bombs themselves. You see the 2,000-pound bombs and the 500-pound bombs towards the bottom right there, uh, 14,000 uh, 2,000-pound bombs, unguided 2,000-pound bombs have been transferred since October. Uh, five and a half thousand of the 500 pound uh, unguided bombs. Uh, vehicles, uh, you know, you do see aircraft listed here. They've been authorized. They have not necessarily been transferred, uh, but, you know, scores of aircraft uh, along, of course, with, you know, as you see there, 44,000 rifles, uh, thousands, tens of thousands of rounds of ammunition, tens of thousands of rounds of artillery ammunition, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and that's all just in the last year. Uh, and that reflects an effort, a purposeful effort by the Biden administration uh, to expedite uh, in every way it can the transfer of arms to Israel. Uh, what that has done uh, is essentially allowed Israel to act indiscriminately uh, in Gaza, right? So if you are a military force that has a limited arsenal, uh, you have to be much more discriminate about your targets. You cannot hit everything. You have to reserve your, your munitions for what you really need to hit. Uh, but in part because Israel is assured of a continuing flow of arms from the US, uh, and for other reasons too, let's be clear, uh, discrimination has really gone out of the window, as has proportionality, that other pillar of international humanitarian law. Uh, and so, you know, what you have seen is the devastation of Gaza uh, that we see today. So I just want to back up for a second and talk about what we mean by security assistance and arms transfers, because those are two terms that get thrown around a lot uh, and often conflated, but technically and under law and certainly in State Department process, they, they refer to two different things. So security assistance is American money. Uh, when we are talking about security assistance, we are talking about your taxpayer dollars uh, that are given to other countries around the world to build their security capacity, uh, typically, uh, through buying American weaponry. I say typically uh, because Israel has a, a unique set aside where it is allowed to use 20% of the money we give it every year to buy from its own industry, essentially subsidizing its own defense industry. Uh, and because it also uniquely uses that money uh, to buy for, for example, to support its purchases of uh, fuel, uh, jet fuel, you know, which is also used in tanks and all that kind of thing. Um, so security assistance is the money. And as we'll see, when we look to, uh, I'm, I'm gonna go through in the next slide, a, a run through of some of the relevant laws, um, but uh, most of the laws that relate to human rights actually attach themselves to the US grant funding, not to the transfers themselves. Uh, just to give you a side idea of the scope here. Um, so on a typical year, uh, the US provides globally through its you know flagship uh, security assistance program, which is State Department foreign military financing, uh, about $6.1 billion around the world. Of that $6.1 billion, 3.3, uh, so more than half, $3.3 billion goes to Israel. Uh, the fact is a further 1.3 goes to Egypt, about 400 million goes to Jordan, 
uh, and very soon you're out of money for the rest of the world. A lot about, you know, 80% of it is going to the Middle East um, and again, more than half to Israel. Uh, so that's the security assistance piece. That's the money. Then there are the transfers themselves, uh, which are separate. Uh, so it, regardless of where the money is coming from, it is coming if it is coming from U.S. security assistance or if it is coming from the partners themselves, uh, those are arms transfers. Uh, those typically go through two main channels, these first two here, uh, foreign military sales and direct commercial sales. Foreign military sales are government-to-government are -government agreements. Direct commercial sales are export licenses granted to U.S. companies. Uh, combined on an annual basis to the globe, those total about $180 billion. Uh, the U.S. is by far the world's leading exporter of arms. It's about 41% of the global market uh, and growing both as a percentage and as a value. Um, but those are the mechanisms. And you know, important to note that both of those, the foreign military sales and the direct commercial sales, uh, for major sales, which are those above certain values, uh, go through a notification process to Congress uh, in which there is a consultation process with the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, with the House Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, where the State Department takes major sales to them behind closed doors and says, we are you know, planning to move forward with this. Do you have any questions? The committees can hold those sales uh, and often do. Uh, in fact, even in the context of Israel, uh, the committees, uh, certainly the House Foreign Affairs Committee Democrats, uh, have held sales for periods of time, for several months uh, in the course of this year, uh, before caving to pressure, both external pressure and pressure from the White House, and saying, OK, move forward. Um, once they give the OK, then these sales have to be formally notified to Congress. Um, and so what we saw, for example, in August was the White House, the Biden administration, uh, in fact, the State Department, notified Congress of over $20 billion in sales. Uh, that included $18.8 billion worth of F-15 fighter jets, <clears throat> excuse me, as well as uh, tank ammunition, mortar ammunition, uh, vehicles, uh, and other, other defense equipment. Um, once a sale is notified to Congress for Israel, it has 15 days uh, to sit. And if Congress takes no action, it can move forward. Uh, for those sales I'm just talking about, that 15 days has elapsed. Uh, we can assume that those sales are moving forward. But uh, Congress does have the opportunity to introduce a joint resolution of disapproval, or a JRD. Uh, and we can expect, actually, that this week uh, the Senate will introduce, uh, certainly Senator Sanders has said that he will introduce uh, joint resolutions of disapproval against several of these sales, not all of them, uh, but several of them. Uh, we can expect that there will be a vote in November. We can expect that vote will fail, uh, probably pretty significantly. Uh, but uh, hopefully it will get, you know, a number of senators to support it. Uh, you know, I think even if it were to pass, of course, again, you know, we're, we're past that 15 days where it can be effective. Uh, but that's OK. It is still, I think, important to show uh, that there is resistance and growing concern in Congress about how U.S. arms are being used in the current conflict. So I know this is a very small print for you. Um, and again, I'll shoot a copy over to the organizers after this. Uh, but here are some of the laws and policies that we're talking about. Um, I split them into, right? So, so blue is security assistance, red is arms transfers. <clears throat> so the laws that apply to security assistance. Um, and I'll just talk briefly about my own experience with some of these. The Leahy Law is the first one. Uh, so the Leahy law says uh, that you can't provide U.S. security assistance, that's the, the money, right, to any unit of the foreign security of the security forces of a foreign country uh, if they are credibly alleged to be involved in gross violations of human rights. Uh, I think it is patently obvious that there are multiple units of the Israeli security forces that are credibly alleged to be involved in gross violations of human rights. Um, there is a process under the Leahy law that the State Department uses for almost every country in the world in which before military assistance is given to the unit of a you know, foreign security force, uh, that unit is vetted. Uh, the names of the people in it and the unit itself is run against a database the State Department holds that mixes both uh, public information as well as classified information. And if there are any red flags, if the unit or individuals within the unit uh, have credible reports against them, uh, the unit does not get the assistance. In the Israel context, the process is flipped. Uh, in the Israel context, we give the assistance uh, as soon as Congress appropriates it. 
and then have created something called the Israel Lehi Vetting Forum, which is a unique body that exists to essentially listen out for potential allegations. Uh, you will not be surprised to hear that in the years it has existed, the Israel Lehi Vetting Forum has never decided uh, that an Israeli uh, unit should be ineligible uh, for US security assistance. Um, that is for several reasons. I mean, obviously it is inherently a political decision rather than a policy decision based on the facts. Uh, there are also some quirks to the Israel Lehi Vetting Forum. So for example, uh, once a credible allegation is received, uh, one of the next steps is that the US government asks the government of Israel about it. Uh, literally picks up the phone or sends an email and says, hey, have you heard about this allegation? What do you think of it? Do you find it credible? Are you doing anything about it? Uh, another quirk is that unlike for every other country in the world where you know a junior officer in the Human Rights Bureau can say, hey, red flag, not moving forward. Uh, in the case of Israel, that decision has to be made by the Deputy Secretary of State or the Secretary of State themselves. Um, so just to get it up to them requires, you know, senior officials willing to put their, their names on such memos, uh, which, you know, again, up until this year had never happened. This year it has happened four times. Uh, in each of those four cases, uh, the decision was made that, yes, a credible allegation exists, but uh, Israel has already remediated it. And therefore, we can continue providing the assistance. Uh, and I think, you know, and happy to chat oh, about why, but just laugh on the face of it. So that's Leahy. There's also Section 502B of the Foreign Assistance Act, uh, which says that uh, no security assistance can be provided to any country, the government of which engages in a consistent pattern of gross violations of internationally recognized human rights. Uh, again, I think the case that Israel, particularly through its occupation in the West Bank, even if we're talking about before the last year, uh, also, of course, in its siege of Gaza and now the onslaught on Gaza, is engaged in a consistent pattern of gross violations of human rights. Uh, but this requires a presidential determination, and nothing forces the president to make such a determination. Uh, there is a section of this law in which Congress can demand a report. Uh, Senator Sanders, again, uh, actually introduced a resolution in the Senate back in January uh, to try and push the administration to provide such a report. Uh, it was defeated. It got 11 votes in the Senate. Um, so that's where that is. Uh, another one worth noting, Section 620I of the Foreign Assistance Act. Uh, this is the law that says that we cannot provide military assistance to a country that is restricting uh, the delivery of US-funded humanitarian assistance. Again, here, we know in the context of Gaza, certainly in the last year, and frankly before then as well, uh, that Israel has been restricting the delivery of humanitarian assistance, including US-funded humanitarian assistance. Uh, but here too, the administration has been uh, unwilling, despite the obvious facts, to trigger this law which would cut off uh, the grant funding that Israel's military receives. Uh, so, you know, short version there, as you can see, how there are laws in place on the security assistance side uh, that frankly are just not being uh, complied with, that we are just not enforcing our own laws. And this is not only a national security and foreign policy issue. I think this is also uh, an American jurisprudence issue. Um, same on the arms transfer side. Uh, so there is this thing called the CAT policy, the conventional arms transfer policy. Every administration since Carter has uh, put in place a conventional arms transfer policy, which is the framework under which decisions about arms transfers have to be made. And to the Biden administration's credit, uh, it's conventional arms transfer policy that it issued in February of 2023 is the strongest, the best to date. Why? Because for the first time, it has directive language. It doesn't just say, here are some things to consider and think about when you're transferring arms, but it actually says, uh, no transfer of arms shall be, or no arms transfer will be authorized when it is more likely than not that those arms will be used to commit or aggravate the risk that the recipient will commit uh, genocide, crimes against humanity, grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions, uh, or other serious violations of international humanitarian law, including serious acts of violence against children. Uh, I think it is absurd to argue that the transfer of arms from the last year has not, at the very least, aggravated the risk uh, that Israel will violate international humanitarian law, that it will commit serious acts of violence against children. Uh, and yet the position from the State Department continues to be it is not more likely than not, and we cannot say that. Uh, recognizing that this is policy, not law, therefore it is not legally binding, uh, I still think that's pretty shocking. 
Um, and finally, on the arms transfer side, where there are fewer ties to the human rights piece, um, you know, the law also says that we can only provide defense articles and defense services uh, to countries for purposes of internal security, legitimate self-defense, uh, counter-proliferation, uh, and to enable a country to participate in collective defense. So uh, where is the internal security, right? We're talking about uh, certainly Lebanon now, but also, uh, you know, Gaza, right? Gaza is occupied territory. It does not, uh, it is not part of the internal security of Israel. Uh, legitimate self-defense, again, under international law, uh, what right of self-defense does a country have against an occupied territory, territory it is occupying? Uh, the answer is that in general, it does not. Uh, certainly there is no, you know, non-proliferation argument here. There is no collective self-defense argument. So I think you could also very easily make the argument uh, that, you know, under US law, that there is no purpose that is lawful uh, for these weapons to be provided. So, um, here are some things I would think about as you're up on the hill. I see your hand is up and uh, happy to yes. take questions. Yeah. Oh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to let you know we have about maybe five to ten minutes before we want to start taking questions. OK, well, the next slide is my last. So, okay. um, so uh, as you are up on the hill, here are some things to think about. Uh, first of all, as I said, um, the House Foreign Affairs Committee and the Foreign Relations Committee uh, do have the ability to hold, right, to stop, to pause uh, arms transfers from moving forward before they are formally notified to Congress. Uh, so to the extent that you are meeting with members of either of those committees, um, that is certainly something you should be pressing them to do, uh, because there remain a number of cases for Israel that are with them um, that they should continue to hold. And as they receive new cases, they should hold those too. Uh, second, as I mentioned, uh, there are going to be a series of joint resolutions of disapproval, actually probably two of them. Uh, introduced in the course of likely this week uh, in the Senate. Um, this only really applies to meetings with senators because um, the process in the House is, is that much more difficult. But in the Senate, there is an expedited procedure uh, where any senator can bring these resolutions to the floor once they once they ripen, as they say. Um, so in any meetings with senators, see if you can get a, a clear yes uh, that they will support the joint resolutions of disapproval when they are called up. Um, on the House side, uh, a bill was introduced last week, the uh, UNRWA Restoration Act, uh, which would restore the funding to the UN Ref Relief Works Agency. Of course, that's the primary humanitarian agency in Gaza uh, that the US has now made illegal under the Supplemental Appropriations Act. Um, because of the language in that act, it requires a change in law for the US to be able to provide uh, that, that funding. Uh, and so the UNRWA Restoration Act would do that. So if you are talking to House members, uh, see if you can get their uh, agreement that they do support the UNRWA, the UNRWA Restoration Act. Uh, you can also press members to engage with the administration, right? So, so the administration does tend to uh, listen to members, uh, or at least I would say the voices of members speak louder than the voices of individual citizens, uh, which to be fair is how it's supposed to work in a representative democracy. Um, so are they pressing the administration on why it is not complying uh, with Leahy, with 620I, with 502B, with these laws we've just discussed? Um, what are the administration's legal justifications uh, on each of these arms transfers or for its continuing security assistance? You know, one of the things the administration has done is had a lot of policy conversations with Congress, but it has never actually provided the legal justifications it is using internally to be able to continue with these arms transfers. Uh, so can it do that? Uh, and of course, you know, one thing the administration has done uh, back uh, in February of last of this year, of 2024, uh, President Biden issued an executive order that allows for sanctions on illegal settlements uh, and the illegal settlement enterprise in the West Bank. Uh, so far, it has used that tool only against a very small number of individual settlers and a couple of what they call outposts. Uh, which are settlers that are settlements that are, you know, even uh, not recognized by Israel. But the way the executive order is written, it can be used against the settlement enterprise as a whole. It can be used against uh, what Israel would say are legitimate, quote unquote, settlements. It can even be used and applied against Israeli government ministers supporting the settlements, uh, such as, you know, Ben Gavir or Smotrich. Uh, so pressing the administration to expand its use of those sanctions uh, is another thing members of Congress can do. And finally, 
um, you know, they can also write into legislation uh, reporting requirements and other legal requirements. I think, you know, there are certainly a number of legal requirements we'd like to see them write into the law. I think it's frankly unrealistic uh, that they will do so in this time frame, given where the politics are. But uh, there are bills coming up. Uh, the National Defense Authorization Act has to go through Congress uh, and likely will in the November, December time frame, uh, as might uh, the the Appropriations Act, which I have here as, as SFOPS, which is the State and Foreign Operations uh, Appropriations Act. Um, you know, people like um, uh, Elizabeth Warren uh, is on the Senate Armed Services Committee. They write the NDA. People like uh, Senator Patty Murray of Washington State uh, is chair of the uh, Senate Appropriations Committee. She writes the Appropriations Act. So can they, at the very least, uh, write into law requirements for reports from the State Department, from the US government, on uh, the killing of Aishan Oeli, who, uh, as you know, was was shot by uh, Israeli Defense Forces, Israeli Security Forces in the West Bank a couple of weeks ago, uh, and other Americans who have been killed. Uh, can they at least write into law a requirement for a report from the US government on IDF compliance with international humanitarian law? Um, so those are some of the things that I would consider sort of having in the back of your mind as you speak with these members uh, and press them to take uh, urgent and immediate steps, in addition, of course, uh, to calling for an immediate and permanent ceasefire. Uh, so with that, um, I will I will stop there and say thank you again, and happy to uh, turn this into a, more of a discussion. Thank you. Well, then, yeah, let's turn the lights back on. And uh, if you have a question for Josh, uh, just raise your hand and we'll come on. Hey, Josh, Mark Harrison. Uh, thanks for responding to my email. I, to... I could you just give clarification on one thing of the ISIS check? I thought that they had already approved an arrest warrant earlier. Now, because a lot of people were saying it now appears that they have not issued an arrest warrant, warrant for Galan or Netanyahu. Is that correct? Right. So, so I, I, I think the question, I'm sorry, it's a bit a bit crackled on this end, but I think your question was regarding the International Criminal Court, the ICC. And the arrest warrant. Is there an arrest right. warrant? Has it officially been? No. no. So, so the, the prosecutor submitted, uh, you know, request for arrest warrants to the judges several months ago. I, I, I think it was in June, maybe. Um, but the, the judges, the ICC itself, has not yet issued uh, those arrest warrants. It, it, it's, you know, it, it may do at any point. Uh, Israel, just in the last couple of days, submitted uh, arguments that those arrest warrants would not be valid and that they shouldn't be issued. But um, it seems that they, issued, they, they submitted those papers under, you know, they, they didn't. It's not within the letter of the process. Uh, so it's now up to the ICC whether they're going to accept those pleadings anyway and review them, or if they're just going to say, sorry, this is out of order, we're moving forward. Uh, but in any event, those those warrants have not been issued yet. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I, you know, uh, I have this concern that after the U.S. administration uh, delisted uh, Kach Hai, the party of uh, Ben Gavir, we got, you know, Ben Gavir and Smotrich from the government, and then we got the Ge Gaza genocide. And recently, the U.S. Um, um, kind of cleared this unit, uh, the Sah Yehuda, uh, from investigation as to whether it qualifies for U.S. arms supplies, and I'm kind of concerned that that's a signal for the settlers of the Israeli army to wreak uh, more havoc in the West Bank and kind of get Gaza it, make it more like Gaza. And what do you think about that? Uh, yeah, so you're referring to, I think it was the summer of 2023. Well, there, maybe it was 2020. No, maybe it was 2020. Oh, 22, thank you, where there were these two two organizations, Kaf and Kahanakai, which are, uh, you know, violent supremacist organizations, terrorist organizations that the U.S. had previously listed as foreign terrorist organizations, uh, which it delisted 
um, you know, back then. Um, and, you know, as you say, uh, Minister Ben Gvir, when, you know, much younger, had been a member uh, of Kach uh, and had been convicted uh, in associated in Israel in association with that membership. Um, mm. I think that, you know, and it was never clear to me, you know, working within the State Department at the time, why that decision was made. Um, because, you know, whether or not those two groups themselves are as themselves, uh, operative right now, and there's reason to think that they are, uh, the spirit of them is certainly very much alive in the settler movement. Um, and we see that on a regular basis now with the attacks on Palestinians uh, and, you know, you know, in the West Bank and, and beyond. So, yes, I mean, I, I think that there have been a number of steps. I think another one I would point to as well uh, was the decision that was made uh, in the summer of 2023 uh, on the visa waiver program. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, an agreement the U.S. has with a number of countries around the world that, you know, U.S. citizens going to, with or U.S. passport holders going to that country uh, don't need a uh, visa to get in. You can just get in with your passport and people coming from that country to the U.S. likewise don't need a visa. And for Israel, it has always been a country that needed a visa to come into the U.S., one of the reasons for that was because Israel doesn't treat U.S. passport holders equally depending on their ethnicity. And that is a requirement that we have. Um, and yet, uh, in the summer of 2023, Israel said, no, you know what? We agree. We'll treat everyone equally. Uh, and the U.S. signed a visa waiver program with them. And there's been manifest evidence, continuing evidence uh, that, you know, people of Arab origin uh, who show up at Ben Gurion Airport are not treated equally uh, to people who are not of Arab origin. Um, so there have been a number of steps the Biden administration has taken, even leading up to uh, last October, uh, that seem to signal to Israel, uh, you know what, you know, it, it's fine. We're, we're, we're backing off. You don't have anything to worry about and, and crack on uh, with your programs, whether that is in the uh, extremist settler space, whether that is in broader areas of discrimination. I, I am meeting, my wife and I are meeting with Senator Warren's staff tomorrow, and I feel like a babe in the woods. I don't know all these acronyms. What would you think of writing a paragraph for me and emailing it to one of us? That's the PowerPoint again. Well, okay. yeah, I mean, no, I'm happy to happy to send you the PowerPoint. And I mean, I think in terms of a paragraph, I mean, first of all, I would say for those of you who haven't had members with uh, meetings before with congressional staff, don't don't be intimidated. Uh, you know, they are um, particularly the, you know, the, the member office staff um, there to do good, uh, whether or not we see eye to eye to them, whether or not their member is where they would like. And, and don't forget that for, I think, a lot of these staffs, the last year has been very hard for them because their members have very often not taken the votes the way they would like them to. Um, right. And that's that's even for the staff, the members who are, you know, somewhat flexible or, or even decent on these issues. You know, I also really feel for the staffs in, in member offices where the members have just been on the opposite side. Uh, and I know it's been hard for a lot of them. But but when it comes to meeting with someone like Warren, I, I think, you know, given her position on the Senate Armed Services, uh, the questions are very much about, you know, will you support the joint resolution of disapprovals that are coming out? Uh, and what are you going to do uh, in the course of the National Defense Authorization Act uh, to, you know, further, you know, tighten the law and, and you know, get the information that Congress needs? Uh, yes, if you can hear me. Yep. Uh, well, first of all, I just want to say you're, you're here, everybody in this room, you're a beacon of, of uh, integrity and, and hope for us all. So, um, it's great that you're still out there working. And, I, and my question kind of relates to that in the sense that, I mean, how how is it that you saw this so clearly and uh, and reached the conclusions that you did about the injustice and the illegality of our government's activities? How does that, how do you fit in with the other people you used to work with all those years? Um, are there are there others who are at least somewhere along the spectrum towards your views of how this is really a very wrongful and uh, destructive and uh, you know, no win way to run this? 
Yeah, no, thank you. And thank you for your kind words. Um, you know, I think that honestly, and I'm just thinking back to the days I spent in government after October 7th before I left, I don't think there was a single official I spoke to who disagreed with me. Um, I, I don't think this was, you know, some special foresight or insight or anything like that. Uh, I think everyone got it. Um, the question is, what were they willing to do about it? And I think that a lot of that was driven by uh, political considerations. And I think what we have here at the end of the day is not a policy problem. Yes, it is a policy problem, but it's a political problem. Uh, and the problem that you hit is that, you know, uh, senior officials who are Biden appointees, who are Senate confirmed, uh, first of all, know that it is a career killer uh, and remains so to, you know, be critical, to speak out on some of these issues. Uh, that is beginning to shift, I would have to say. And there's been evidence in the last few months that there are more and more mm -hmm. senior officials within the system who are willing to speak out. Uh, but there is also certainly a, a great sense of loyalty, right? Those people are placed there by the president uh, and you're not going to turn around and, you know, stick your finger in his in his eye. Um, and so that's a part of it as well. Um, and there are also, you know, um, people, I think, you know, have some, degree of, of thinking of, well, you know, I don't have the whole picture or uh, I just, this is not my role. My role is to do X part of the foreign policy process. And, you know, therefore, you know, who am I to say? Uh, so I think there's part of that as well. But but I don't think the issue is that people don't understand it. Um, and again, you know, at the time that I left, uh, when I handed in my resignation letter, I sat down with senior officials in the State Department um, and they said to me, yeah, absolutely got it. Uh, can we find you something else to do? Uh, and I said, no, I'm not, I'm not, you know, leaving because I just don't want to be a part of this. I'm leaving to because I want to speak up against it. Uh, and they said, yeah, you know, fully understand and good luck. So, you know, mm -hmm. what can you say? Dom, next. Again, I want to affirm your decision and thank you for your courage in doing that. I'm a little unclear. We're meeting with our congressional representative who's a modern Democrat. Who won't even sign on for ceasefire? And uh, what should we ask of this person in terms of uh, uh, opposing the arms transfer? I'm I'm clear of the uh, Sanders bill in the Senate. What is there? I'm not clear what's going on in the House. And what should we ask? Um, so, if I heard the question correctly, it was uh, members who have not yet called for a ceasefire. Um, what can you ask of them? Is that right? Or in the House? In the House, yeah. Um, so, so first of all, in the House, right, so so there are different processes in the House that make it harder uh, to, for example, introduce a joint resolution of disapproval to block, um, to block uh, aid, uh, sorry, to block, uh, you know, military, military sales. Uh, but there are things that they could do. For example, as I had mentioned, there is the UNRWA Restoration Act, uh, which has been reduced, which has been introduced in the House, um, and they can become a co-sponsor of that. And I would say, even if it is someone who is not calling for an immediate and permanent ceasefire, uh, that is the sort of thing uh, where it is clear that there is a vast need for humanitarian assistance uh, that they could perhaps, you know, lean into if they don't feel comfortable calling for a ceasefire. Um, you know, there are other areas, depending on how closely into the weeds you want to get. But for example, Israel has been restricting uh, the ability of uh, urgent patients to be evacuated from Gaza. Uh, there are many thousands of, you know, particularly children, but not only children, uh, who are suffering both from injuries from bomb blasts, but also cancer patients and, you know, other, uh, you know, serious illnesses who need to get out, uh, which Israel is not getting them out. You know, if the member isn't willing to call for a ceasefire, surely they're willing to ask for a child to be evacuated. Um, and I think that that can also be a useful foot in the door. Uh, you know, finding those sorts of issues to get around that, okay, you won't call for a ceasefire, but here's a plain humanitarian issue. Uh, can't you, as a human being, call for that? Uh, I'd like you to talk a bit more about the legal situation of the U.S. in terms of the fiscal and the bill-sharing uh, support how that affects our house and Senate. I'm sorry, I'm just going to pause you because I can't, I can't hear you very well. Yeah, let me check. This one closer. 
Um, I think you'll just need to speak up as well. Right. So, can you try again? Brenda, Brenda, can you try one more time? Could you repeat? Oh, okay. Maybe come closer. Maybe come closer. The mic is not there. It's over here and right there. Oh, um, I'm, I'm very interested in the legal justification that America has, has imposes in terms of its fiscal and military support and how that impacts the Senate and House. And what can we speak to that? Um, clearly in terms of even our presidential candidates, because I'm concerned that this may in fact impact how we address the ceasefire and peace plan in Gaza. Right. So I think, first of all, when it comes to the current policy decisions that are being made by this administration, um, Again, there are routes for Congress under the law to to pursue to try and address those. One of those we've talked about the joint resolution of disapproval. One of those, you know, we've talked about the the five hundred two B resolution to demand a report. Uh, unfortunately, uh, all of those require not only, frankly, majorities uh, in Congress, uh, but in the case of, for example, the joint resolution of disapproval, super majorities uh, in order to be able to overcome a presidential veto. Uh, that is why no joint resolution of disapproval, no congressional attempt to block an arms sale to any country has ever succeeded, uh, because there's never been a possibility of getting, you know, two thirds of the House and Senate. Um, so the, the options there are limited. Of course, Congress could pass additional laws uh, that would be more explicit, that would maybe tie, for example, the Leahy law, not just to the funding, but also to the transfers themselves. I think that should have been done years ago. Uh, but... Uh, does not have the votes right now to do that. Uh, and I think what you would hear from congressional staff and members behind closed doors uh, is that they don't even want to put forward a bill like that right now because the chances are, if you open up the Leahy Act, the Leahy Law, uh, to congressional debate, what you'll probably end up with is an amendment that exempts Israel entirely. Um, so that's where we are politically on the Hill. There are certainly... Um, you know, some options to a, a limited extent through the U.S. courts. Uh, you may be aware of the Center of Con for Constitutional Rights. Uh, they have been pursuing a case under the Genocide Convention. Uh, that case was dismissed by a federal district judge uh, on the basis that this is a policy question, uh, not a, a legal question. Um, the, uh, the, the case is currently being appealed to the Ninth Circuit on bank, to the entire Ninth Circuit. Uh, but it, there is a very high bar, unfortunately, in U.S. law uh, for the ability of citizens to hold the government accountable when it comes to national security and foreign policy through the courts. Uh, and so that remains a, a, an ongoing challenge. Uh, so I would say, unfortunately, uh, really, this again comes down to politics. This comes down to showing uh, our voices matter, our votes matter, uh, and that politicians have to listen to us. Uh, on these issues, because there isn't much other option when it comes to domestic options. I think we have time for one more question, and I know uh, I saw two hands. I'm not sure which one. Maybe which one each. Maybe a couple questions. We'll do two more questions. questions. Yeah. Sure. Okay, just a quick question. But our congressman, I'm I'm Mary Hirschberger with Prince George's County for Palestine. Our congressman what says he wants to talk about. What's going to happen after the ceasefire? Mm -hmm. So my question is, how can we center the security and the interests of Palestinians? Because we constantly hear the Israel's interests and Israel's security centered. And so my thinking is, suppose we do get to a ceasefire, what then? Because how do we move the discussion to focus on Palestinians as real human beings with real lives that we should be concerned about? Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, yeah, so on that one, so two things on that one. First of all, I, you know, look, we, we do need an immediate and permanent ceasefire, but I'm very cautious about sort of leaning too heavily into this idea of a ceasefire uh, because I don't think it means to Israel what it means to all of us, and I don't think it looks uh, in reality what we think it will look like. Uh, the day after, I, I'm not sure the day after a ceasefire, looks significantly different to the day before a ceasefire, right? You've already got this massive humanitarian catastrophe on the ground in Gaza uh, that is going to take a generation, if not generations, to resolve. 
Uh, and of course, you know, even if there was a ceasefire in place, you know, are you telling me that, you know, if Sinwar popped up, you know, on the streets of Gaza tomorrow, Israel wouldn't take the shot? Of course they would. Um, so I don't think, you know, that there is that the, the whole discussion around a ceasefire itself, it's important, uh, but we shouldn't think that it is the end state. It is it is a beginning state, um, if that. Um, and in terms of, I mean, I think you've hit the nail on the head. What we have is a massive issue with the dehumanization of Palestinians. Uh, you know, one of the other people who resigned from the State Department, Hala Rarit, um, gave an interview, I would definitely refer you to, uh, where she was asked, you know, how much of, uh, how much of the problem here is racism? And her reply was, all of it. Um, mm. And I think uh, bringing Palestinian voices to the fore is important. Uh, I think also flipping the script, as you've just said, uh, right? So people are always saying, well, you know, don't Israel, doesn't Israel have a right to defend themselves? Don't Israelis have a right to live under rocket fire? Yes, of course they do. Don't Palestinians have a right to live, oh. live without the fear of oh. rocket fire? Don't Palestinians have a right? And so just turning, I find these questions around can very can be very effective because you'd be amazed how often people like look struck when you say that, like it's never occurred to them uh, because it has never occurred to them. Um, so I, I think, but I, I think that's absolutely right. And then obviously focusing again on the, the urgent humanitarian needs and pointing out that this is also part of the security problem. That if we, if Israel, if this member of Congress wants Israel to be secure, to be safe, that is not going to happen unless there's also security and safety for Palestinians and for Israel's neighbors, uh, that the answer here is peace. So you made it really clear that the Leahy law and the other laws that you outlined in that PowerPoint don't function at all for Israel, basically, and never have, I assume. Um, uh, okay. I'm wondering, is that just sort of the case in general with our arms sales to foreign countries, meaning we don't do very much oversight, period? Or is Israel just really an exception here? And with other countries, we do a much better job and we actually do care about these things. Um, the question. So, so two things on that. First of all, I would say that um, there are gaping holes in the laws that govern arms transfers and security assistance, right? And one of them, uh, example is, is that, you know, the Leahy law applies to the money, uh, but not to the arms transfers itself. So if you recall, you know, go back uh, five, six, seven years, uh, US arms that were being transferred to Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates uh, were dropped on Yemen and killed thousands of Yemeni civilians. Uh, there was never any debate then about Leahy. Why not? Because the Saudis and the Emiratis were paying for these weapons with their own money. Therefore, Leahy doesn't apply. Uh, so oh. the starting point here is that there are massive gaps in our in our laws. Uh, but and, you know, just to caveat and clear, clarify on that as well, that, that, yes, you know, not only are there massive gaps, but we often also make these, you know, terrible decisions uh, that end up doing a lot of damage and a lot of harm. So so, yes, all of that is true. But in addition, uh, there is also a, an extra level of politicization. Uh, when it comes to Israel. There is no other country for which there is this process uh, of, uh, you know, the israel Lehi vetting forum where we ask Israel and it has to be the Secretary of State's decision and all this kind of thing. I mean, there are just layers upon layers of additional, uh, you know, political involvement when it comes to these questions. And to give just one final example, you know, we talked about the 620i uh, law that says the US cannot give assistance to a country that is restricting humanitarian assistance. Uh, that law apparently, uh, I'm told, has been brought up uh, in the last year uh, in the context of Egypt. Uh, the idea was, well, you know, Egypt is on the other side of the border. Uh, we should think about applying it to them, uh, but never in the context of Israel. Um, and so I think that just tells you how how politicized and, and how much, you know, sort of uh, scar tissue there is, I think, around these issues within government. Uh, that, that protects and that shields uh, Israel from the full and proper application of our laws, as weak as those laws are.